I'm going to be honest with you right off the bat. I always get a little bit nervous whenever I'm reading. So if you see me shaking or doing something like that, short of falling on the ground, everything's okay. Um, so I'm going to read to you uh, from the lease. Uh, Greg mentioned that the, we might have heard some kind of you know, like rough or, or offensive language in, the, in what he was reading. You're definitely going to hear some here. Uh, so I'm giving you that warning in advance. Fenceless. There are no signposts, no old men waiting to tell you here. This place repeats itself. Everywhere you've been is folded into grass and dirt. And you blame chance, not science, for putting the iron here. Like no seismic charts were read, no holes drilled. As if wealthy men and God just wanted you sweating in the mud. But the cows... They can find borders even under daylight's sterile sun. Watch nations grow from boot prints. Divide the plain by men and else. They graze away, uncountable, unheard as you walk the field, tool to tool, with no sense of what is yours and what is not. At midnight, under the shelter of the flare, of smaller. The world flits in firelight. Cows gather in darkness near the edge of the site, scratching thighs against steel tankers. Gut sounds and groans fill the lease like braille. Coyote howls leap over each other in the stark beyond your sight. The flow and whistle of the well quiets. and your world, the flare, begins to shrink. You feel your stomach tighten, a dirty man at a tundra fire wrapped in leather, chewing meat, a thousand years ago. Uh, if there's an Alden Nolan fan, then they might notice I cribbed a bit of that line. Uh, so part of working, and I, I worked all through kind of southern Alberta and Saskatchewan, and part of that means you're traveling all the time, and staying in a lot of motels and, and hotels and all of these motels seem to be called the Prairie Schooner, uh, regardless of you know where you find them. Uh, and then one time they told me, you know, we're, we're going to send you to Saskatchewan and you're, you're going to be staying at the ranch. And I thought, like, nice, I'm going to be staying at the ranch, okay. Uh, so after about six or eight hours of driving, my supervisor says, like, okay, we're almost here. And we pull into the ranch. And I, I wrote this poem about the ranch. And that's the title. You sleep on stacked mattresses, and mice run the floor, biting at toes. You wake, set traps, and stack the mattresses higher still. This is old Sask summer. Flax and mustard paint the horizon, the bright yellow color of sun you find in children's pictures. And always, the sky is just another dead prairie above you. Everything you remember lives inside the chicken farm homestead with its back broken frame and that reek of old water sitting still. At night, the house breathes with open windows, swells at the seams. At sunrise, it exhales a dust so fine you think of bull hearts, dried and ground. When it's gutted of furniture, you find imprints in the carpet, four beds, two dressers, a shelf. And from those years when no one kept it, from before the oil and the oilman came, the mark where the deer walked in, lay down and died. So that was the ranch. Um, the, deer, the deer was not still there when we arrived, but uh, <laughs> once, uh, once we kind of got to know the people in the town, the, uh, the younger kids were like, that's, you're, you're staying there, yeah. out of the ranch, at the old like McMillan place. Yeah. When, we used to party up there, but then there was a dead deer, so we stopped. Um, uh, so throughout the book, I, I write kind of a, a number of what I, what I came to call portrait poems while I was, uh, I was going through it, uh, which are just kind of about you know, one person, and maybe I make some stuff up about them or not. Um, and... Uh, Coach has had me change all of these names because they're they're smart. <laughs> and 
And since the very first reading, I've just been telling everybody the real names because I'm not. So this poem is called Stephen, but it's really called Lawrence. <laughs> uh, loves his kids, hates their moms. Wears wife beaters like someone slapped a paintbrush down his chest, left him stained, white striped and dirty. His belly seems swollen. Reaches from his skinny frame so that when he falls into a chair, he looks always like he's been feasting. All he eats are 7-Eleven Frozens. Heated, rushed to his mouth on plastic, he breaks the cardboard flat at the corners, licks it clean. Stephen Lawrence will tell you he ran with gangs in Calgary and has some native in him. Everyone from Sask does. His truck blares Corblund. He brings you whiskey in a coffee pot to drink as he drives. And uh, Stephen slash Lawrence drinks while he drives. Wash out. Across the field, you can see a farm girl who might be pretty, stripped down and out of the forest coveralls. Gets you hard if she wasn't hidden so well. Kind of gets you hard anyway. She climbs the tractor, her legs bouncing against the sides of her loose rubber boots. Like you've always The first time you drove a car, the engine kicked. It sounded like a cold clean out, a blowdown, a frack, a bleed off. When you learned to knead dough, your father's palms over your hands, there was a man outside punching holes in the earth, making your mother's windows buzz and rattle. Does the farm girl hear this over there in the tractor cab? Does she know it's you? Near the end where the steel turns 90 degrees, goes straight up. Some burr inside catches, peels off, and the sand cuts through the pipe and into the air. But your hands, they're already in an X above your head when you remember the sign for shut the fucking well. I love those really long pauses where you always watch me drink water. Uh, so while we were having dinner, I, I mentioned that the first class I did in my uh, MFA poetry at the University of Guelph, and the first class that I had was with Dion Brand, and I walked in and I was just quivering. I was terrified because she's incredibly brilliant. Um, and I wrote a bunch of crap all class, just crap, week after week. And not in the way that people say, you know, I'm writing crap. Not like that, like actually. Um, and then I started kind of messing around with these oil field poems, and, and this is the first one that I brought in, and, and Dion looked at me and said, uh, yeah, do more of that. And I said, okay, good, sure. Cows at night. They lick air like salt, shoulder to flank, groaning forward. Ripples in the darkness, shapeless if not for the rodeo memories, the flicker of the flare along their backs. This is when you think of meat and leather, as if there's nothing else to say of a thousand legs, haunching through shadows like one as, as if every question still left inside the night must be broken into currency, counted. So at, at the start of most jobs, you've got the kind of like orientation day or, or two days or something, you come in and you learn all the ropes and you learn like, do you have some weird? I don't know, I 
sheet. And uh, naturally the same thing happens in the oil field, but it takes a couple of days and they kind of set you up in this back room. And they just make you watch it. Be so. And the title of this poem is, is the name of one of these kind of safety tips that we had to watch. Let's remember Charlie. You can guess, right? <laughs> yeah, things aren't so great for Charlie now. Uh, in the back room of the shop, you spend a day with Wemyss and Piper Alpha and a videotape of Charlie burned up. When someday you want to roll up the sleeves of your coveralls, let your bare wrists touch the breeze, risk the gas in the air, they want you to remember him, how he pulls his red sweater up his arms and how you will always see his pale skin as darker and redder than the yawning mouths of the dogs who terrorized your youth. The video finishes, the VCR gears click, the tape rewinds for the next guy, and you start guessing at appearance fees, video royalties. Later, you and the boys will bargain in skin percentage, trade burns or breaks, bulk sell fingers for a better deal. You all figure you'd cook half your body, the lower half, for an even million. And when Joel's wife shows up for his paycheck a few weeks later, when you watch the half-circle, barrel-edged nub of his wrist forget itself and grasp for a beer, you find yourself tuned to every clash of steel on steel. You see snakes shedding skin in hospital beds. You remember Charlie, and you begin to wait. Rigging. The sweat in August drenches your tan clothes brown. By January, it crisps your eyebrows in ice and you fight the wind for breath. You lay pipe like limbs along the lease. Hard shapes, hollow and straight, they charm oil like a snake from the earth. You do not understand this. It is not math or language not the migratory pattern of geese to be charted. This is muscle lust, fucking with your eyes closed, the body's quiet genius. You cannot map it, the elbow twist, wrist snap, wrench tug. You give up, history, science, all the words you know in French, forget to watch your hands move. At night, you ache with work ground into muscle, bleed it out in sleep. Your arms push and pull at the air above your bed, miming the rig in. You will wake to steel bird dirty sheets, darkness, and the diesel rumble of a new day in the drive. I'm taking a detour here. Service rig. Half these men are boys, like you are, but yell so loud the cracks in their voices are hard to catch. The other half, giants, older than the rig itself, they knew this oil before it was black. A bare chest here is thin and folded into itself a thousand times. You've never seen them take the head off the pump jack. It's clean in the dirt when you arrive, but you get to see the service rig rising. The tongs turn on. Watch the youngest man on crew climb the derrick and stand, harnessed, coveralls dropped from his chest and tied with the sleeves around his waist. Up where no one can yell at him to zip up, no one can tell him to remember Charlie, where he can feel the prairie wind beating his chest like the skinny fists of a woman who almost wants him to let her go.
So there are a couple of poems that I don't normally read because they're a little weird. Um, but you all seem like you're going to be fine with them. <laughs> I don't think it'll be an issue. Uh, so part of the work that uh, that I was doing was at the... Uh, does anyone know hydrogen sulfide? So for those of you who don't, hydrogen sulfide is... Uh, kind of a poisonous gas and it will knock a person out in, in kind of really low concentrations even and then you fall down and a minute later you're, you're dead. Um, so we had to spend a lot of time wearing these kind of breathing masks. Um, and uh, be like really, really very careful about you know any kind of breaking the seal and no one can have like stubble or anything like that. Uh, and we'd be under air for, it's what we called it under air. And uh, you'd be doing that for hours. And you've just got so much time to think because you're not really doing anything a lot of the time. You're just like kind of looking at a meter like that. Um, and you just kind of think about what it is that you are not doing. And this poem came from that. Under air. All men must be clean shaven. A small mustache is acceptable, but the rubber has to seal. Here, your pale boy face is a virtue. The men dull ten razors a month. You're lazy, don't lift much and can barely hammer, but you can stay under air for hours. The steady in and out sound of oxygen rushing your face through its tubes, that urgency of gases forever escaping itself. Even sour gas, heavier than air, hurries to the earth. Your soup watches you 30 feet away, waiting for you to drop. And you think of how the gas can kill your lungs, your brain, but your ears, they're fine. Your fingers, fine. And could it get into your coveralls? Sneak up inside your ass? Finish you that way? Incident report. Fatality. Worker dies from H2S anus contact. All employees must wear latex underwear. Bums must be clean shaven. A little hair is acceptable, but the rubber has to seal. I don't know science. Moths, all backlit by the flare, known by their shadows. The little hairs or feathers or dirty white dust that shingles their wings. This is around you, cools under a white frost that grows thick even in the unsung swelter of the night. You grip the line like a throat, squeeze until water falls down your forearm. Your fingers ache. Two. The oil moves from hand to face. Your skin painted pale brown, dusted dark with dirt and seeds. Smaller hands once grasped at trees instead of steel, and sap stuck your fingers closed. It was wiped into your eyes until the lids caught and balked with every blink. You broke branches, kicked old trunks until they bled dead matter, spilled their secrets to the ground in larval letters. Three. The forest fell away before you and grew thick behind. That place knew itself even in darkness, when all the earth and animals were what you named them, where you climbed. Pines stretched upward and down at once, unkempt branches twisting like roots toward the sky. You pissed where you pleased, carried an axe on your shoulder like a man. If it fell wrong, there would be no one to sew you shut or carry you home. Four. There is earth below your earth, a deep room where gas and oil, rock and stone, circulate like slow blood through a body. The world beyond the flare, the up close of prairie grass in the dark, beetles and mice, haggard coyotes who lie on their backs, face the mother sky, wait to be fed, the spotlights show moths, 
a billion beating wings that make the air so thick and dark you can't even form a fist without crushing dusty bodies. Five. At 3 a.m., there is no world but what's contained by the flare's domed light. A great dark glass over an insect, you are the only thing with feet and hands on a flat and dying. A man trapped 12 hours in the caves of the open land, and no one searching for him, no one to know he's gone. Eight. In the push gas river, oil grown thicker in the line. You break the pump like shelling fruit, find it in the gasket, the broken diaphragm. You change old pieces for new metal, plastic wrapped parts, fresh lungs in their boxes, small and glinting, breathing shallow in and out. Nine. In the streets of Toronto, Gas lines rise like organs, break ground and hang from the bottom. Pumps, the regulators that live tucked in alleyways. No one hears the migrant gas barely hissing meters below their feet. But you walk like a child, head down, searching after the hum beneath the city, a mongrel, hoping the sound will lead you to its home, taking a stroll. Ten. In the blank-faced hotels of the roadside prairie, you lie wrapped in floral sheets. Dream of women with tiny names planting clover in your sink. You work the patch at night, sleep through the day. Heat the room with your skin, boil moisture from the air. You wake at noon, check your phone, count your money. Imagine a figure bent over a desk writing you letters. Someone old and beautiful who still knows remembers and cares where in the world you are. I just have a couple more for you. They're all super upbeat. Uh, so, uh, earlier I kind of, I read you a poem called Wash Out, and that's kind of about one of the everyday things that can happen when you know, a lot of turn sand back and they eat through the pipes where you're transporting all of the gas or the oil or whatever you happen to be transporting and it kind of just rips away at the metal and shoots at the side and if it's really high pressure then it shoots out really far and can be a little bit dangerous but this is kind of an everyday occurrence it happens pretty normally especially if uh, things like fracking are happening uh, the really bad thing that can happen is called the blowout and this is the thing you see on TV where, uh, where there's like all of the black smoke and everything is out of control um, and this is a real worst case scenario, and uh, it only gets worse if this uh, gas also happens to be hydrogen sulfide and poisonous. Um, and it basically means that the well head that used to control everything is just gone, and now all of this stuff is just coming up out of the pipes. This poem is about driving home and kind of seeing some smoke in the distance. Newell. You can see the smoke by Vauxhall, a short day, a shallow frack. You reach home but keep driving through brooks, past the patch motels, to Newell and its oil-smudged sky. <coughs> As a child, you painted your face this color, ash from driftwood burnt on the beach, jellyfish drifting upside down, charting dead angles, the sand against your stings. A blowout, they both guess, Mike in back, king cab, and the soup driving. It's all sour, too. You hit a barricade a kilometer out, firemaster trucks everywhere, the campground evacuated. Two dead when the stabbing valve went. The pipe swung so fast it took one guy's face clean off, but you only know this later. On that day, you drive with your asses off the leather, so close to yourselves, toes curling after something solid, a foothold inside your steel-toed boots. So I'm just going to read you two more. Um, the next one is by far the creepiest of all of the poems in the book. So remember me up here looking very smiley and kind 
as I read this very creepy poem. Kelsey. This girl was supposed to be Stevens. When after a few drinks she starts kissing you, he tells you to fuck off and leaves, but comes back later while she's pissing and asks if you will share. Just home for the summer, she's suspicious, thinks the green bound heaney is your way of tricking girls into bed. After two months in this motel room, it's stranger to see someone touching your things than to feel her fingers curl against your shoulder on the left side where the muscles tore when Stephen dropped his end of the pipe. A ball player, hardball, national level, you wish she would believe you really just want to talk and kiss a little, and if she wants her body felt or if she wants to touch your dick, that's fine, but you mostly just want to talk. She says her school is down in Texas, Christian, too, but she goes there more for baseball than Jesus. They won't let boys inside her dorm, and maybe that's why she has to leave so fast when you take her hand in your palm and press them both against your crutch. You wonder if you can get out before her, lock the door behind you and run home to her house, fall asleep in her bed. You will wake to bacon and eggs, a family breakfast where everyone mistakes you for Kelsey. You will cuddle with, with her sisters, and they'll pretend you aren't half hard against their backs. Her father will kiss your forehead, call you darling, and help you practice pitching in the backyard. In a lifetime behind you, a girl paces the motel room, pulls strips of callus from her heels, scalds her hands in the bathroom sink, sits with her back against the door before turning and chipping half her fingernails on the knob. Anything to try and wake her from your life. So I lied to you. I'm going to read you two more. They're short. Uh, every spring in kind of southern Alberta and Saskatchewan, uh, the snow melts. Happens here too. Um, but out there it melts and it kind of turns all of these fields and these uh, range roads and back roads into just muck. And it shuts down all of the, uh, the oil patch for a couple of months. And they call this breakup. And uh, every single year, it is an enormous surprise to the oil industry of Alberta and Saskatchewan. And, uh, and the oil workers just take a sudden nosedive into poverty. This poem's called Breakup. Men lose their trucks in April, cave by May and pump gas at 10 an hour. The snow melts, the earth soaks to mud too thick for rigs to move. The sky is a leaky roof, and they dream of catching rain in buckets. Cocaine turns to codeine. Cash bleeds out like a well. Their clothes stink. They eat the dollar menu, bitch about road bands. Some even go to Lakeside, work the killing floor, shave beef from bodies hung on hooks and belts, run the gun, avoid the eyes, the single filed flesh of thousands sluices through the graded floor, all until the sun batters the earth to grit again. This is the last poem I'm going to read you, so thank you so much for listening, even all the way through the long one. You ask your father what a lease is, and he tells you about the geese beyond the aqueduct, how they turn the sky gray, how as a teen he never put his gun away dirty. You remember the blue steel cleaner, the sound of a rag drawn through a barrel, and still you catch the scent of solvent rising from buried cells that ruled you as a boy. The lease is meaningless. A square paced first by seismic workers, and then your father, and then by every other man you know. But you've always pulled meaning from nothing, and when he leads you to an empty field, you tear grass in fistfuls. Read the roots like a will. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Matthew, very much.